Good morning, VCF. Well, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. We're going to be looking at uh, the second half of John chapter 8, so if you could turn there with me in your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be one tucked underneath the seat in front of you. John chapter 8. This chapter is massive. There's so much that was going on uh, last week, and I could only get to uh, small parts of it, and this week is the same. Um, My daughter started doing something really interesting. She's seven years old, and... Um, My wife, Natalie, is an artist. Uh, She has a little studio downtown called Natalie's Folk Tale. And when she comes home, she paints at home as well, just because she loves doing it. Well, Navine also loves to paint. So she likes to get out big pieces of paper and paint with watercolors. But she's been doing something else that I I really think is pretty awesome. The other day, she had her... uh, It's these calico critters, little tiny animals. And the daddy bunny had the car flipped sideways and had his hands in the car. And I said, Navine, what's what's daddy bunny doing? She goes, he's putting the transfer case in the Jeep. (laughs) I was like, yeah! And then she asked me, daddy, did you get the drive shaft in so we could put it in the Jeep? And I was like, this is so great! And then she said, oh, can we watch an episode of Dirt Every Day, which is my favorite show about these two guys up in Paso who build four-by-fours. And I was like, oh, my daughter, she's becoming like me. And in some ways, that's great, and in some ways, that's scary. Your children will emulate you as their parent, whether you like it or not. And when we were at Bethany Farm, Natalie and I, when we were running the camp, during the summer, there would be some kids who were just the most well-behaved, sweetest kids. But then there were some kids who were absolutely rotten to the core. They desperately needed Jesus. And it was interesting how we could tell which kids had parents who really deeply loved them And which kids had parents who perhaps did not? And at least they they weren't emulating their love or or showing their love to their kids. There was one little girl who was terrified to sleep in the cabin at night. She just just couldn't do it. She was absolutely terrified. And so the next day, uh, we tried to convince her parents to come pick her up. And and the dad over the phone was like, no, she'll be fine. It's, It's not a big deal. You know, she'll, she'll get through it. Just, you know, keep her there, please. The next morning, he came to pick her up, and he said, well, no wonder she's so scared. This farm looks exactly like the place where all the murders happen and all the horror movies that she watches. And I was like, the horror movies that your seven-year-old daughter watches? He was not parenting his child. Your children will behave like you because a child will emulate their father, their mother. Well, in our, in our text this morning, Jesus is going to point out that all human beings have a father that they emulate. Turn to John chapter 8, verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I tell you that what I have seen from my Father in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your Father. Abraham is our Father, they answered. If if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things that your own father does. 
We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Then Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here now. I've not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why do you not believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I'm not possessed by a demon, Jesus said, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he's the judge. I tell the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Now at this, the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you are demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that anyone who keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father, Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old. The Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was, I am. At this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him to death. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. This is the word of the Lord. I want to pray one more time. Father, this passage is filled with with a profound truth about humanity, about us. And it's that we are prone to believe lies. The world is filled with lies. We are bombarded with a barrage of lies day after day. Lies that we speak to ourselves, lies that we speak to others, lies that other people tell us that we easily believe. God, we need to be able to see your truth. So I pray that this morning as I preach your word, you would speak through my mouth, that I would be your mouthpiece and speak the truth. Show us what it means to be a true disciple and to believe the truth. We love you, God. Amen. So in our series in John, we're looking at the I am statements of Jesus. Jesus made seven I am statements, and they were metaphorical. And this one is true of Jesus as well. I am, and he says, before Abraham, I am. And you're going to see after this morning's message why the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus because of this. Let me ask you a question. What does it mean to be a Christian or a believer or a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, Jesus tells us very clearly in this passage what it means. He starts out by saying, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And who Jesus is speaking to right now are people who are on the edge of true faith, belief in Jesus. They've been listening to Jesus' words. Remember, he's teaching in the court of women, the most populated part of the temple. It's during the Feast of Tabernacles. They've lit the candles. It's glowing, and he's teaching. Well, right here in verse 30, it says that, Even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. These people are starting to believe Jesus. They're hearing his words, and even some of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are starting to believe what Jesus is saying. They're right on the edge of belief, but there's something else that is required. Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. If you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples. Disciples. And this is the word that defines what it means to be a Christian. 
disciple. Mathetis is the word in Greek. It's where we get our word math, mathematician from mathematics. It's the, it refers to the mental effort needed to think through something carefully. And then not just to think it through, but a true disciple is someone who thinks about it and then someone who does it. They think about, how do I apply this truth that I have just heard and do it and, and live it out? So a disciple is someone who hears and does. So if you hear the words of Jesus, if you hear the words of God, and then you do them, you are truly a believer. You are a disciple. You're a follower of Jesus, a disciple. These are some of the characteristics of a disciple of Jesus. Your core identity is that you are a child of God. God is your father. You are a son or daughter of the king. You walk in the light. Jesus was just saying, just teaching that. You know, as they were lighting, he says, I am the light of the world. And if you walk in the light, you are truly one of my disciples. They walk in the light. We're going to see in this passage today that you walk in freedom, freedom from the slavery of sin. You abide in his word. You adhere to his teaching, the truth. And you emulate Jesus. You look like Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus in his word, you begin to talk like Jesus and think like Jesus. You begin to act like Jesus. You are a true disciple. But the Jews protest. And now I have to explain here. When it says the Jews, it's talking about the teachers, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the important Jews here. These are the ones who are right on the edge of belief, but they're still holding fast not to the truth of Jesus. They're holding fast to their own religion and their own way of thinking and living. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? So here's the lie. They say, we've never been slaves. Can anyone point out <laughs> the lie there? <laughs> have the Jews ever been slaves? <laughs> the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the <laughs> like, they, they've been slaves. Who? Who are they enslaved to right now in, the, in this passage? Rome. They can look down and see the Roman Empire crushing them. See, the Messiah that they were looking for was going to be a great and mighty, powerful ruler and king who was going to come and destroy the Romans. That's who they were looking for as a Messiah. And many of these teachers of the law, scribes and Pharisees, they didn't even really want a Messiah because they had such a high position of authority and they were in cahoots with the Romans at this point that they didn't even really want a Messiah. But Jesus is telling them, if you abide in my words, you'll be set free. And so this is what they say, but this is what they actually mean. This is, this is what they was implied. They, they were lost. They did not have salvation. They were not right with God. And this is what it means. If, if what it means to be a disciple is that you hear Jesus' words and you believe that they are true and you follow them, what it means to be lost is that you're utterly convinced that you do not need salvation, that you don't need Jesus' words, but the truth is that you are in grave danger. You are enslaved to sin. Your core identity is your father is not God. Your father is someone else. You are not a son and daughter of the king. You walk in darkness, not in the light, as Jesus is in the light. You walk in slavery, not in freedom from the slavery of sin. You are lying to yourself. You're self-deceived. And truth, what is truth? Truth is relative. As Oprah once said, the most important thing is to live your truth. Your truth. Truth is defined not by God, not by Jesus, not by his word, but by you. This sounds a lot like the original lie told by the enemy, that you can be God. So Jesus is trying then to show these teachers of the law that what they are saying is in fact a lie, and it's keeping them in slavery to sin. Verse 34, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's 
descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. So Jesus begins this great debate between himself and the Pharisees. And so in this debate, he first tells them the truth. The lie was, we, we have Abraham as our forefather, and so we have no sin. We have righteousness. But the truth is actually that anyone who has sinned in any way is a slave to sin. And the only way you can be set free from sin, and this is true today, is through the Son, the Son of God. Jesus is the only one who can set you free from the slavery of sin. And Jesus uses this analogy. He says the son has the same authority in the household as a father, but a slave has no authority. If you are a slave, you are a slave to sin. But you can only be set free by the son. And now the Pharisees are starting to get a little aggravated. When they, they were aggravated before, but now they're really starting to get angry. So they engage in the debate as well. Jesus, uh, John, rather, reiterates this truth about slavery to sin and the nature of lie, lies, lying to ourself, in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, he says this. This is the message we have heard from him. He's talking about Jesus said this. And when did he say this? He said it right here in this passage in John This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. If we claim we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we say that we have not sinned, as the Pharisees claim, We're lying to ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. And God's truth has no place in our lives. There's no room because something in our heart is already there occupying the throne. And what's occupying the throne of your heart is you and your own rules. I'm following my own rules. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm on the right side of history I've done all of the good things and said all of the right things. I need no salvation. Well, there is no room for the Savior on the throne of your heart because it's occupied by King you. And here, as we continue in this passage in 1 John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. His word is not in us. This is what Jesus is telling the Pharisees, and so Jesus' argument is that true freedom can only come from the Son. The Son has the authority of the Father, and you are still living as slaves. So, If you claim that Abraham is your father, but you're not living as Abraham lives, he's going to make this argument here in a minute. Who is your father? Jesus is implying this question. Is Abraham really your father? Is that true of you? So they say, yes, Abraham is our father. That's all they say. But here's what they mean. Because Abraham's our father, we are God's chosen people. We don't know who you are, mister, but we are God's chosen people. We have a right relationship with God, and and therefore righteous. That's not how you spell therefore, but hey. We have the patriarchs, the law, the prophets. Who's your father, Mr. Nobody? Who is your father? We know who our father is, Father Abraham. He had many sons. I'm one of them. (laughs) but not you. We know who our father is. And Jesus says, if Abraham, verse 39, if you were Abraham's children, notice he changes the word there. Before he said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. But now he says, 
if you were Abraham's children, here's the difference between a descendant and a child. A child acts like the father. They emulate the father. A descendant is from the father in name only. And here, Jesus says, yeah, you've come from Abraham, but you are not of Abraham. Because if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the same things that Abraham did. What did Abraham do? Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. What did Abraham do? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. What did Abraham do? Abraham believed in ultimate redemption through the one and only son. This is how the Old Testament, the people living in the Old Testament, I, I get this question a lot as a pastor. How did the people in the Old Testament have salvation when salvation is only through Jesus? Well, the Old Testament uh, patriarchs, they believed by faith that the Messiah was going to come and they put their faith and trust in that person, Jesus to come. We, on this side of the cross, we look back at the cross 2,000 years and we say Jesus came to redeem us, to reconcile us to God, and he brings us salvation by his sacrifice. See, the near sacrifice of Isaac was symbolic of what was going to happen. That God was going to send his one and only son who he loved and place him on the altar of sacrifice, the cross. And that by his blood shed, his blood would cover our sins. And that by faith in Christ, we too could have our sins covered by the blood of Jesus. Abraham believed by faith. And Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children, I know you're his descendants, but if you were his children, you too would believe by faith that the Messiah has come and that he is speaking to you, that the Son will set you free. They're right on the edge of belief. But the lies are louder. The lies are louder. And so Jesus says, Abraham's children do what Abraham did. They believe by faith. When Abraham was told the truth from God, he believed it. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Look what you're doing. Look at the fruit in your life. You're wanting to kill me. You're wanting to murder me. This Abraham would not do. You are not acting like who you claim as your father. You are acting like another father. He still doesn't name it yet. So who is your father? Jesus is essentially asking. Who is your father? Well, at this point, they're getting really angry. And they say, well, at least we're not illegitimate children. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father that we have, and now they, they you know, up the ante, the only father we have is God, Yahweh. He's our God. He's our father. Now, there's, there's a couple of things that they're implying here as well. They're not just saying... We are not just descendants. We're actually children of God. They also say, oh, yeah. We know someone in this argument who was born of a virgin. Yeah. They're essentially calling Jesus a bastard. They're saying, you're the son of illegitimacy. You were born out of wedlock. That's, they're using this as a slam against Jesus. We've got the law, we've got the prophets, we've got our heritage, we are sons of Yahweh God. Well, now Jesus takes the argument a little further, and he says, Jesus said to them, verse 42, if God were your father, 
you would love me. For I came from God, and I am now here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? It's because you have not the ears to hear it. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, and then he names who their father is, the devil. You belong to your father, the devil. Um, I think it's important to explain the devil. Because some of you, maybe, in your minds, same thing with like when people think of angels, they think of like naked babies with wings, you know? Wrong. <laughs> That's the cartoons. Same thing with devil, the devil. You think of like a red guy in a tight suit with a tail and, you know, a pitchfork. Wrong. That's, car- That's the cartoons. That's the cartoons. This word, this Greek word here, diabolos, means accuser. Accuser. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. First book of your Bible, third chapter. Everybody there? Remember that little trick I taught you with your finger? Where you put your finger in it? Okay. Now flip back to, to John chapter 8. I'm going to continue reading this. And we're going we're to go right back to Genesis 3. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks the native language, his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear what I say is that you do not belong to God. Diabolos means false accuser. It's not a, not a shiny little red guy with a pitchfork and a pointy tail. This is the great enemy of God. The enemy of God, the accuser who speaks lies. Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. The enemy, the accuser, tells lies. And Jesus is telling these people, You are not behaving like who you claim is your father. You are acting exactly like your father, the devil, the accuser, the liar. Why? Because you are speaking lies and you are believing lies. VCF family, people who are unbelievers, who are unrepentant, who are living in sin, they are slaves to sin because they are living in lies. They're believing lies. They're telling themselves lies. And they are being accused by the liar himself. Lies are the native language of the enemy of God. Whenever you speak lies, you are acting and speaking as an enemy of God. An enemy of God behaves in this way. They tell lies about other people. They believe lies about other people. They tell lies about themselves and they believe lies about themselves. An enemy of God believes and tells lies about God. There's there's five lies that the enemy tells to the woman in the garden. And he's still telling these lies today to people in this world. The first lie is this. God's word is not true. Did God really say? He questions God's word. God's word is not true. The second lie is that God is not good. Did did God not say that you, you can't eat of any of these trees? That's not what God said. God said, you can eat of all the trees except for this one. He's good. God doesn't want what's best for you. 
God doesn't want you to be able to enjoy these things in the world. And the worst lie is that sin is not that bad. It's not that bad. You will not surely die. I had the dinner with a friend last night, and we had an excellent conversation. And we were talking about the lie of lust and how lust can lie to you in this way. It, what it does is it makes you seem special. The enemy will say, no, 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 you can indulge in this. You can indulge in this because you're different than all the other men whose lives have been completely destroyed by this. You're different. You're special. The lie of the enemy is that ultimately, you don't need God. You can be God. Listen to what the enemy says. You will not surely die. Sin has no consequences. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. You can define good and evil on your own terms. You don't need the word of God. You don't need to go to church on Sunday and listen to some guy give a TED talk. You don't need to go to a small group Bible study and sit in the awkwardness and you don't need to be faithful in prayer because it's actually really hard. And those of you who don't like reading, I mean, if your entire faith is based on reading, good luck with that. Do you hear the lies of the enemy? You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. Look at your past. How can you ever overcome that? You don't need this. And the lie of the enemy for the Pharisees was that you don't need salvation. You are saved already. You're the ones who make the rules for all the other people. It all rests and depends upon you. And Jesus says, you are acting like your father, the devil, the accuser, the liar. He was a murderer from the beginning, and that's why you want to murder me now. That's why you want to kill me. And finally, the debate is starting to get so heated that the Pharisees respond in this way. The Jews answered him, you're a Samaritan and you're demon-possessed. It kind of reminds me of the scene from Monty Python in Search for the Holy Grail where they're talking to the French knights up on the castle and he's like, your mother smelt of elderberries and your father was a hamster. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen that movie. It's don't recommend it, but it's hilarious. And they're having, they're having this argument, and what happens is they resort to name-calling, which is like the lowest part. Actually, I have to share this graph with you. So I don't know if you can read this. Probably not. It's pretty blurry. So, wow, it's like exceptionally blurry. Uh, I'll just explain it to you. So when you are arguing with someone, there are tiers of... The worst way to argue to the best way to argue. At the top is refuting the central point and providing evidence and a counter argument. You're refuting the actual argument. You're not attacking their character or an ad hominem or responding to their tone or their, uh, their character. At the very, very bottom, the very, very bottom, and it's what we see mostly in troll comments on the internet, is name calling. Well, you, you're this. You're an idiot. You're a Samaritan. You're a filthy mud. mud. You are demon possessed. This is what they're doing to Jesus because they're, they're out of arguments. And Jesus is telling them the truth. And when people who are so used to hearing lies and live in lies hear the truth, they, oh, they balk at it. It's offensive to them. Why? Because they're living their world upside down, and all of a sudden they see something right side up. You might remember me talking about this. When they see something that's right side up, they say, look how upside down that is. And it's the only thing that's right side up. Jesus is telling them the truth, and for the first time they're hearing actual truth, and it's disgusting to them. They don't want to hear it, and so they make fun of, they ridicule. And they, they resort to name-calling. And Jesus simply says, 
I, I'm not demon-possessed. I honor the Father. A demon can't honor God the Father. I honor my Father, and you are dishonoring me. I'm not seeking my own glory, but there is one who seeks it. And if anyone keeps my word, and he is the judge, and here's the truth. Here's the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. It's what Jesus started with. If you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, you're a true disciple. And a true disciple will be freed from sin and will never see death. God's word. God's word. How do you distinguish in this world filled with lies that you hear all the time, that you read every day, that you hear from people all the time? How do you distinguish between what is true and what is a lie? It's by the word of God. When you're abiding in God's word, you're, you're dealing with the real deal. You're dealing with absolute truth. And the more of the scriptures that you know, when you hear a lie from the world, you're immediately able to say, that's not true. That lie is not true of me. That lie is not true of them. That lie is not true of this situation and this circumstance. Jesus says, I honor the Father, you dishonor me. Demons cannot honor God, but I do honor God, and I seek his glory. And he will prove that what I say is true. And then when Jesus says this, he who keeps my word will never die, that sets the Pharisees over the edge. There's no longer belief. There's no longer any faith. At this, the Jews exclaimed, okay, now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, so did the prophets, yet you say that anyone who keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? And Jesus says, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I do. I know him. If I said I did not, I would be lying, like you are lying now. But I do know him, and I do keep his word. And your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. He saw... What, what did Abraham see? As he was taking Isaac to the altar to sacrifice him, his one and only son, his son who he loved, knowing that this son is who the redeemer of all of my family line and now all of human history is going to come. It's through this boy. And he lays him on the altar ready to sacrifice him. And what does God do? He says, stop. I'm making provision I'm going to provide Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. And what does he provide? To take away the sins of a substitute lamb. To take away the sins of the world. His one and only son, Jesus Christ. Abraham rejoiced because he knew that the God who would provide in place of his son is the God who would provide in the future the Messiah to redeem his people. Abraham believed this. He saw it. He rejoiced. He knew that this was true, that everything God was telling him was true. That God is who he says he is. The great I am. God of all creation. And Jesus says, I know what is true, and I am telling you the truth now. Abraham rejoiced to see this day, the day that when the Messiah would come. You're not even 50 years old the Jews said, and you've seen Abraham. Who are you? Who are you? Just tell us flat out. Who do you think you are? Tell us. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was, I am. Ego, I me. Exodus chapter 3, the same exact words that God spoke to Moses when Moses said, Who are you? Who shall I say sent me to you? 
I am who I am. This is what Jesus says. Now, if you thought the Pharisees were mad before, (laughs) at this, verse 59, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Now, uh, many scholars believe, and I do too, that this was also miraculous, that Jesus could escape. He was surrounded by these people, and he made his way through the crowd and escaped. It's not the first time that Jesus has done this. It was not yet his time. But this is the first time that people who hear the truth about Jesus and reject the truth about Jesus want to kill Jesus and actually try to do it. It's going to happen again in chapter 10. The world needs to grapple with the reality of who Jesus is. The world needs to understand who Jesus is. Jesus tells us that he is the light of the world. And last week we learned that Jesus then says, I am the light of the world as long as I am with you, and you need to abide in me to be light. And then before he leaves, Jesus tells us that you are the light of the world now. You are going to carry the light of Christ in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you speak the truth about who Jesus is, expect to be ridiculed. Expect to be hated. Expect to be slandered and expect to be lied about. The world hates the truth. But those who have ears to hear, and we don't know who those people are. Jesus tells us to go and to speak the truth, to make disciples, teach them everything I I have taught you. When you go do that, it's not your responsibility to save people and to open people's ears. It's your responsibility to know the truth the truth that set you free, to share that truth with other people and watch and see who will be set free from the bondage of sin. The truth will set you free. And who does that? Jesus does it. The Son sets you free. We need to be a people who abide in the words of Jesus. We know the words of Jesus. Um, This Wednesday at the Johnston's house in the backyard at 6.30, Uh, We're going to have some food, and we're going to have the first of what I call the gospel workshop. And it's essentially a time for us to get to know each other a little bit, but also to get to know the way that we can preach this truth. And in a way that is compelling, in a way uh, that uh, is palatable, but in a way that doesn't water down the truth. And we don't need to add insult to injury. You know, we don't need to make the the truth about God even worse by bashing people over the head with the scriptures. We need to be able to engage with people in a compelling way, but allow the truth to speak for itself. The truth of God, the truth of the scriptures is foolishness to those who are perishing. The Pharisees heard this and they thought it was foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God into salvation. Jesus has given us his word and we have to abide in it to be his disciples. And we have to live it to shine the light. And we have to tell it to set people free from the slavery of sin.